once again, welcome everybody. It's great to be together. And again, if you're new to Cornerstone, welcome. So glad to have you today. We are in part two of a series called Signs of Life. And we're working through the seven signs of Jesus recorded in the Bible in the Gospel of John. We have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and... John and, so good, you guys are good. So we're working through uh, the gospel of John a bit and maybe you've been in a spot before in your life, maybe you're there today where you've had doubts in faith or you've just wanted to have a better understanding of who Jesus really is. Well, John wrote his gospel, the entire gospel that he wrote for that purpose, toward the end of helping people have confidence. In fact, John said this, toward the end of what he wrote, there's 21 chapters in chapter 20, He says this in John 20, 30 and 31. He says, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Notice there's two key phrases in there that we really want to hone in on that give us the purpose of John's gospel and why we're doing this sermon series and looking through it to begin with, all right? Two phrases. He says, I want you to believe that and I want you to believe in. He's writing so that we can believe that, that we can believe and understand some of the unique things about Jesus and who he is and so that we can believe in to trust him to be the leader and savior of our lives and to do exactly what he has told us he has done and he will do. And by understanding that we can believe that and believe in, we believe that for understanding, we believe in to trust him. We can have life like we've never had it before. Understanding, that's the head, right? We, we understand things with our head and trusting, well, you know where that goes, that's the heart. We trust things, you're gonna really count on. When we bring those two together in Christ, that's where we can find really abundant life that Jesus offers and that's why we're doing this series. My hope is that each of us can come to a better appreciation and love for who Jesus is and gain confidence in him as we look at these seven signs really beginning today. Now, we're looking today uh, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry in John chapter 2. John 2 is where we're going to be. Jesus is about 30 years old in this story. He was baptized just recently by John the Baptist, who we talked about a little bit last week. He has just called all of his disciples that are going to stay with him for a period of three years, his 12 followers who become the leaders in the early church, and the scholars believe that in this story in John 2, that Jesus is in his very first week of ministry. This is the very beginning. Most likely, he met Andrew and John, the author of the gospel, on Sunday, and now it's Wednesday, right? The disciples don't all know each other. They're still wearing name tags. That's the status we're in. It's just been a few days They don't really know each other. They haven't seen what Jesus is gonna do. I mean, with the stories that we know and that we hear about and that we talk about, all of that is yet to come. Jesus and his new disciples are headed to a wedding feast in a small town of Cana in Galilee, likely because, or as the text says, they were invited to come to the wedding. It's possible that Jesus was already part of the wedding feast. Now, I saw this scene depicted in a show called The Chosen, Any of you guys seen the show on the internet called The Chosen? Okay, if you have not seen The Chosen, you need, I don't know what you're watching, but you need to watch The Chosen, all right? It's a very, very recently finished, uh, season two just came out like two weeks ago. Season one is awesome. It's the life of Christ. It's set in the first century. It's the best depiction of Jesus' life that I've ever seen on film. So you should check it out. It's free. They have an app that's on YouTube and all kinds of other stuff, right? The Chosen. And in The Chosen, they, do, they have this scene in one of the episodes of Jesus turning water into wine, which is the scene we're going to talk about today. And it's important that when we read the Bible, which I hope you do read the Bible, and if you don't, this is a good time to start. Grab a Bible and the book of John and just read through and read through and read through. We want to read the Bible in the context that it was written in. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about in this series is helping put us into the mindset and the situation in the first century so that it makes sense. Every word in the Gospel of John, every line, everything is there for a reason. It is inspired by God, and John did it very intentionally. When you put those two together, we have a lot to glean. If we go in with open minds and open hearts to believe in and believe that, God's gonna show us a whole bunch. If you would turn to John chapter two, if you have a Bible, John chapter two is where we're gonna spend time 
today. And we pick up the text in verse 1 of John chapter 2. The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. So imagine the scene, okay? It's a wedding celebration. We never really know who this couple is. We're never given any knowledge about them, but we know some of the important guests. We know Jesus, the disciples, and even Mary, his mother, is there. And in the first century, you know when you go to a wedding where you're like, oh man, that wedding Saturday, we're gonna have to plan like half the day because we gotta drive to that place and then we gotta hang around for the reception and all that. Not in the first century. In the first century, we're talking a week to two weeks of a wedding celebration, it's big time, all right? You really make a big deal out of weddings. And some of you that are like looking forward to a wedding one day are like, that sounds great. Let's just do it for a long time. Let's just plan it out. The families of the bride and groom in the first century would host a celebration with their closest friends and family to mark the occasion over a two-week period. And the expectation during that time is whenever they get together and they're celebrating and they're you know, having a good time with their family and friends, that they would be provided food and plenty of wine for the guests that are there. To run out of food or wine during a wedding celebration when you're celebrating this amazing thing that's happening in your family was a big cultural no-no, right? You don't want to do that. And living in a small town like this family did, if they ran out of wine, which is what's happening in the story, it would never be forgotten. People would always remember. They'd be like, remember that time? Remember that time when they ran out of wine at their son's wedding? Ooh, that was rough. Yeah, yeah. They're always going to remember that. They're going to have this mark on them of the people that ran out of wine during their son's wedding, which is a big cultural no-no. And so Mary, in whatever relationship she has with this family, Mary urgently requests for Jesus to do something. Do something about it. So he responds in verse 4. John chapter 2, verse 4. Dear woman... That's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. This is a good little mother-son moment here, isn't it? Like you can kind of see what's going on. Obviously, she knows who Jesus is and what he's capable of. We don't know if Mary's seen him do miracles that aren't recorded or anything like that. But he's 30, and he's never been grounded So he's in good shape right now. Like Mary's like, you're a good son. You're a really, really good son. She has other kids at this point, but I think we can all agree Jesus is her favorite. (laughs) Never had to put him in time out. Nothing like that. He's never had a spanking. Okay, nothing, right? And obviously she knows who he is. She goes directly to Jesus to solve a problem that no other human on the face of the planet could ever solve. The wine is gone and there's nowhere to get any more. And interesting, Mary only appears in uh, two stories in the Gospel of John. She's only there twice. This one, then the other one is when Jesus is on the cross. Mary's at the foot of the cross as he's being crucified. And he gives her the same designation both times. He calls her, her dear woman, which is this term of endearment to his mother. And most scholars believe that when Jesus came into this moment, he's not doing a He's not trying to play pranks, right? Jesus was probably not planning to do a miracle on that day. He was not ready to start his public ministry where he said, this is not my time, this is not my hour. In fact, in a sense, he doesn't start his public ministry that day because all of this is somewhat behind the scenes. And I don't know what happened in that moment when he said, no, this is not our problem, this is not my time. I don't know if he had a look in his eye or if Mary was just determined, but she did not hear that and she just said, do what he says. Do whatever he tells you. Essentially, here's the deal, servants and everybody else around, Jesus is here. Things are gonna be fine now because the one who has solutions to things just showed up. He is the answer, and I don't know how he's going to figure this one out, but do whatever he tells you to do. That's a really good thing for us to remember in life. Just do whatever he tells you to do. And I love what this story shows us about the character of Jesus. Jesus, in this moment, is not motivated by publicity. He's motivated to do this miracle by compassion, He is responding not to publicity. Everywhere he goes, Jesus is caring for people and healing people and loving people in what he does. He never shows up to the scene going, 
please go and tell all your friends about these miracles I have performed today and see me tomorrow morning for another set of miracles with Jesus. Subscribe to my Instagram page or to my YouTube channel and like me on Instagram or whatever. He doesn't do anything like that. Instead, he's responding to the love of people that he has. In fact, if you look at the miracles of Jesus, normally what he says after he does a miracle is what? Anybody know? Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. I don't want no... I know you were blind your whole life. I just gave you eyesight. If you don't mind, don't tell anybody. Not gonna happen, Jesus. I'm gonna go tell everybody that you just gave me sight. But he is saying to them, it's not about the miracle. I didn't come to be a miracle worker. I have miracles to do in the hearts and lives of people beyond their eyesight for longer term than that. And I love this about Jesus. He sees people. Nobody's just a number or a body in the crowd. He sees their situation. He knows their heart. He cares about their needs. Friends, we have a Savior who is very, very personal and very intentional. He's very intentional. Nothing gets by him, no details. He never comes back around later to our lives and says, listen, I'm really sorry I didn't notice what you were going through that day. I didn't really respond in a compassionate way because you were having a hard time. Like we all have to do with people, he doesn't have to do that. He never misses it. And in his earthly ministry, he is motivated to action by his incredible compassion and love for people. He can tell when somebody's in a spot needing a touch of love from God and he's the one that can provide it. And in this case, he is moved by the love of his own mother and by the love of this family who are facing probably lifetime embarrassment and so... He takes action, verse six. Pick up the story in verse six. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. Now, these are no ordinary jars. These are not mason jars, okay? These are giant stone basins, like kind of like this one. This is not stone, but kind of it holds about 20 to 30 gallons. We think this one holds about 20 gallons. So most of us, we don't have basins laying around that hold water like that. For the most part, we don't keep water like that. Now, each of them can hold all this water for two primary reasons. The first is for cleansing people's feet when they arrive at the house. The second is for ceremonial washing. Now, the first one, when they come to a house, they come from a dirt path, they're wearing sandals or they're barefoot, and if you see anything in the Middle East, it's very dusty, there's not a lot of greenery around in a lot of the parts of the Middle East, and so the dust is flying, and when you're walking on dust roads every day and you go into somebody's house, you don't wanna carry all that dirt in. And so they had, by the door, typically, if they're a well-to-do family, they may even have a servant there with a basin where they could dip in and they could take the water and they wash off their feet at the door so that their feet don't get the house dirty. But the more common or, or even more frequent situation with these basins is the ceremonial washing that the law required. To Jews, they were required to wash their hands all the time. It was like religious hand sanitizer. They had to do it all the time. They would wash their hands before a meal. They washed their hands in between every course of the meal and after the meal. And these jars were there set in a specific system to uh, make sure that you could do it properly where you come into the place where you're about to eat or whatever and you could ceremonially wash. And they had a whole process. First, that you would have your hand and you would have your hand pointing face up and you pour the water towards your palm over the front and back of your hand then you would face your hand down and you pour the water over the front and back of your hand. Then with that same hand, you take the knuckles of your other hand and you sort of rub it into the palm of your hand in order to ceremonially cleanse that part. I don't know if they have the signs up like we do to show us how to wash our hands. Aren't those so helpful? Like, please rub your hands together. But they... They would wash very specific pattern they would follow every time. Then they would do the other hand in the exact same way, over and over and over again. And if you did not wash your hands in that way, technically you were unclean, even if you had you know, tried, which is a huge no-no to the Jews. Right? They, they didn't, nobody wanted to be unclean before God, 
So the jars were there for this purpose, and they do exactly what Jesus says the servants. They fill these jars to the brim with water, and then they dip some out, and they take it to the wedding host, which seems like a really risky moment. Now notice, remember, John puts nothing in there by accident. Nothing. Every detail in line is for a purpose. Isn't it interesting that what he shows up with Jesus' first sign of life, if you will, the very first miracle that he performs in the gospel probably made no sense to the people with whom he was performing the miracle. Can you imagine being the servants? Have you ever thought about the servants in the story? I mean, why did they listen to Jesus? Did they know who he was somehow? Did, did they just trust Mary because it's like that woman said to trust him and I don't want a piece of her, so uh, we're gonna... Yeah, we're, we're gonna listen to this guy? Or were they just so desperate in this moment that they knew that this is the worst possible scenario to be out of wine? Maybe he has a solution. We don't know that for sure. Here's what we know, is that they listened to Jesus and took action. And I love what that tells us. Friends, Jesus displays his power through faith in action. You see the most power of God when we're willing to step out and put ourselves in position for the power of God to be ushered in. Faith in action is where God often does his most powerful work. We don't know when the water was turned to wine. Did Jesus do some like finger snap and everything in all those jars was wine? Or is it when they actually dipped in that it turned into wine? Or is it when the master actually took a sip that it tasted like wine? I don't know, I've never seen that happen. But they had to take action in order to see it work. They had to show in action the faith that they had in this man that they were putting their confidence in. Faith in action is where God does his best work. When we're willing to recognize that we don't have every detail sorted out, and we are willing instead to just trust the master with the outcome, that is what faith in action looks like, and that's what these servants did. He didn't have to use the servants. Think about it. They could have been eliminated from the whole scene. Jesus could have just done whatever he does to make it happen and filled those vats with water himself. But he didn't do it that way. He chose to display his power through an act of obedience, and he usually does. Look at what happens a little further in verse 9. John chapter 2, verse 9. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. He said, a host always serves the best wine first. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. They go from the potential shame to great honor. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and the disciples believed in him. There was always somebody at the wedding festival, they're the master of ceremonies, or what I've seen called the Toastmaster, which is my favorite name for him. I'm just going to call him the Toastmaster from now on, All right? The Toastmaster is... Uh, kind of a combination of caterer and DJ all in one. They would take care of the festivities, make sure all the food's continually going, the wine's continually flowing, the music is happening, or whatever other details are happening. And it appears that he did not even know what was happening with the wine situation because he would have been pretty worked up. I'm guessing the servants were too scared to tell him about it. For whatever reason, he is not clued in yet. And amazingly, he never finds out what happens. The guy in charge of the details, they kind of kept it from him and made it work behind the scenes. As far as we can tell, nobody at the party, including the family, ever mentions Jesus. He, he gets no credit for turning the water into wine. It's not like, and we just want to thank Jesus for providing this round of wine. Everybody, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. That doesn't happen in the story. In fact, if he would have become the hero in the moment, the family would have still faced the social shame, and clearly that didn't happen. Instead, Jesus displays his power through the actions of some servants who were willing to trust him. And we can't know for sure how John knew about this story. The disciples chose to trust Jesus at the end of that story. They're like, man, we trust him. So probably they knew something. But, you know, after Jesus' death, his mother, Mary, ended up living with John. He asked John to take care of his mom. And I tend to think that Mary, I, this is just the way I like to think of it, all right? Like years later, Mary's like, hey, John, remember that first day 
that first week when I met you and, you know, we were in Cana at that wedding, did you know what Jesus did? Did you know? And she tells him the story and he's like, man, he's more amazing than we even thought he was. He's always doing miracles and working behind the scenes through people and in people's lives more than we even can dream. Friends, it's a private miracle done seemingly behind the scenes through some unnamed servants to show people what it looks like for the power of God to move in an act of obedience. Now, however the details exactly worked out, the water was turned to wine, the toastmaster was blown away by the quality of the wine, and the family is honored. And it turns out to be the really, really, really good stuff, and nobody would have saved that till the end, and the toastmaster is thrilled. Now, some have argued that in this story, and maybe you've heard this before, like, well, would Jesus turn the water into wine? It's not like real wine. It was like grape Kool-Aid or something without alcohol. Has anybody heard that before? No? That's a story. That's not actually what the text says. Jesus turned water into some amazing wine is what the text says. And now we don't need to try and change the text, but that does not mean that Jesus is endorsing over drinking. If some people are like, well, remember Jesus turned water into wine, so pass it around like Jesus loves wine. I don't think you can go quite that far, okay? That would be ignoring the dozens of biblical warnings about overusing alcohol. We need to be aware of what the Bible actually says. In fact, drunkenness was a huge issue in the first century, and it would have been completely frowned upon in their culture, so that is not the point. Plus, their wine is different from wine, what we think of as wine today. Their wine is three parts water, one part wine. So I guess in that way it sort of was from concentrate, wasn't it? Like Gatorade or something. But the point of the story has nothing to do with alcohol, nothing. It has to do with who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing. And it shows his compassion for everyone and how he works in power through those who are willing to be obedient. And it shows that he is indeed the one who brings fulfillment. Remember in the story there were six jars, these big basins? In the Old Testament, six is a significant number. And throughout the Bible, the number six represents incompletion, while the number seven represents fullness or completion. And the wine had run out, and there are six jars of water there remaining. John puts the details in for a reason. He's reminding us through the story, it seems empty, it seems incomplete, it seems like there's no solution. All they had was six jars of water plus one Jesus. Six jars of water plus one Jesus brought all the fulfillment they could ever need. He fills the jars with exactly what was needed, and then he went way, way, way beyond that. Friends, Jesus is the completion. Jesus is the fulfillment. Jesus is the one who makes things right when they're all kinds of out of sorts. The original readers of this story, they, they also know about all the ceremonial laws. They know the original purposes for these jars. They know what they're there to do. And in Jewish law, the ceremonial cleansing, it was constant. You're constantly cleansing yourself. You could never be really clean. You were just sort of not unclean. And by God's design, the ceremonial cleansing was never completed. You were never finished. It was never over. It had to happen all the time because it was actually a symbol as you washed yourself as to what was coming, the actual cleansing of your heart, that one day they knew that the cleansing would come through the Messiah, that the new covenant with God would come through the sacrifice of the Messiah, how he would come and make things right, and it would finally be complete. No more rituals, but complete cleansing in him. And of course, the washing of your body is a good idea, it's, not, it's necessary, cleanliness is good, but you can wash your body and your hands all you want. It never molds the heart. Jesus turns ceremonial water to wine to bring honor to a family, yes, but to also show us that all the rules and all the laws and all the ceremonial efforts could ever make together all of those efforts that we could do on our own, that is never going to fully cleanse our hearts. That only happens when we allow the Lord to bring ultimate cleansing to our lives. These jars, imagine how much wine this is that's now at the wedding feast, six of these lined up full of wine. The most conservative math says that 
they had an additional now at this party, 180 gallons of wine additional, which just to give you a picture is four bathtubs full, modern bathtubs full of wine. And if you're more of a bottle person, that's 900 bottles of wine that Jesus provided in addition to what they already had, okay? It's the last day of the wedding feast. This is like pretty excessive. (laughs) There's no way that this wedding party and all of their friends could ever touch all of the wine that Jesus produced. No way. Jesus is kind of saying to all of us through his action, my grace, when you have me as your fulfillment, I don't stop at the end of what you need. I'm always pouring out more. There's always enough for everybody with more to spare. Jesus offers grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. He never gives us only what we need. In fact, you could say that the limitless grace of Jesus overflows to everybody. Everybody's in path to receive the grace of Jesus. Whenever you think that you've been given grace enough and maybe you, you know, God shine on you one too many times, he offers more. When you've prayed the same prayer over and over and how can you be in this place again and how can you come before God because after all, you've already asked, you already told him you were never gonna sin again if he would just answer this one prayer and you sinned again. You know what he offers? More grace. He offers grace upon grace and when you need a little bit more grace, he doesn't give you a little bit more grace. He gives you bathtubs full of grace. The wine in the story becomes the very best of the night, which points to the fact that one day there is going to be a wedding feast that we're invited to, friends. It's the wedding feast of the Lamb. Everybody's invited to that party. Everybody might want to go to that party. That one day in heaven we get to have a wedding feast where God is the one throwing the party. I want to be at that party. And every time we come together as a body and we stop and we pause and we reflect on communion, we are reminded that there is no limit. That little bit of grape juice and that little piece of bread, they are limited. But what it represents has no limits. Jesus is here. When Jesus is here, he can always give more. There is always more from him. His grace is overflowing. He offers us the purpose and the unlimited meaning and blessings that come with knowing Jesus. Anything that we could ever dream up, our hopes and our dreams and our expectations that we do through our efforts, none of those are ever gonna get there. And we're always gonna fall short. But in him, we find limitless grace. In him, we see the Savior, the one who can take something that seems impossible and makes it possible. And I think John's trying to tell us we look at this story, like he didn't just turn water to wine. He fulfilled everything that this wedding needed. He is the fulfillment. When Jesus is there, fulfillment can come. And the great news is what he did that day 2,000 years ago in some village named Cana was not a one and done thing in his life. Yeah, we don't know if he did water to wine again. But he is doing that kind of action every day. Have you experienced it? Have you been turned from something? When he takes something that is empty, when he takes something that's lost its spark, it doesn't feel like it has any meaning anymore. He transforms it into something new. He takes every life and turns it from water to wine. He's a savior that is all about conversion. He never touches somebody and leaves them the way they were, ever. No, he's always taking us forward. He has the power of God, the supernatural power of God to change things, to move things, to shape us. And that's what John wants us to know, that when you come into a personal walk with Jesus, he brings a new quality to your life that was not there before. It's as drastic as turning water into wine. It was not before, and now it is because of Jesus. That's what he does. And that's what he wants to continually do in me and in you. Shaping and molding us. John had lived it. That's why he wrote this gospel. That's why he wrote in the first chapter one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. John chapter one, verse 14. There's so many things I love about this verse. Very, very full of depth. But listen to what he says in John 1, 14, just one chapter back. He says, the word became human and he made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory. 
the glory of the Father's one and only Son. We've seen his glory. We have seen it. I'm writing to you about something we have seen. When we saw him, it started to become clear. We started to see the glory of God. We saw the power of God in him. We saw the grace overflowing and overflowing into people's lives more than they ever needed. Imagine what it must have been like for John to write this gospel. And to tell this story, one that he's likely told hundreds of times before he ever writes it down for us. John writes this down 70 years after it happens. He's had seven decades to walk with the risen Jesus, to come to a deeper and fuller understanding of who he is. He's had 70 years to pray and remember and meditate on these stories and now to circle back and write them so that he can tell us, I saw his glory. We saw it. And imagine if John was just telling this story to you, which he is. Now he sees it so clearly, how Jesus does things and how it all comes together and how it all makes sense and how Jesus is always walking in full fulfillment and in compassion toward people. Can't you just hear him saying it? Can't you just hear John saying, man, everywhere we went, everywhere we went, Every time he came into somebody's life, it was just like that. He was willing to change water into wine in the life of whoever he touched. And still today, for those of us that are willing to see it and willing to receive it, he offers it to us as well. Fulfillment and the Savior, if we're willing to believe in him and see abundant life. And maybe you're in a place today where you're going, man, I am so thrilled that I get to serve that Jesus. Or maybe you're in a place where you're saying, I know I need the love of that kind of a Savior. Bathtubs full of grace? Who offers that kind of grace? Jesus. Jesus does. And if you're in a place today where you need to follow after a handful of people who have already made a decision today to accept Christ as Lord, we're gonna finish up in a few minutes and we have our prayer partners available. We'd love for you to have a conversation with somebody. Don't leave. If the Holy Spirit is churning in your heart that you need to be obedient to him and walk in him and surrender to him today, let me pray for you. God, we are so grateful that we see stories and not just that we see a historical story of something that happened but that as we walk with Jesus, Lord, we are water to wine. We are broken to whole. We are confused to fulfilled. That we can find that kind of meaning and purpose in Christ. Oh, we thank you for it, God. Thank you for Jesus. And we lift him up and we proclaim him, God, and we just ask you to meet us right where we are, as you always do, and transform our hearts into the hearts that he's called us to. And we pray in the power and the name of Jesus.